This is the 2020 Shelby GT500, and it's the most powerful Mustang ever. In fact, it's the most powerful Ford ever, and you'll be able to buy it in just a few weeks. But today, I'm going to review it. I've borrowed this GT500 from Ford here in Las Vegas, and first I'm going to give you the numbers, and I'm going to start with the big one. This car has a 5.2 liter supercharged V8 with 760 horsepower. That's 43 horsepower more than a regular Hellcat and 110 more horsepower than a Camaro ZL1, meaning that in the ongoing horsepower wars, this car has just fired a new shot. That amazing horsepower figure means that this is indeed the most powerful Ford ever made. In fact, it has 115 more horsepower than the new Ford GT. It also has 250 more horsepower than the outgoing Shelby GT350, which I already thought was an amazing car. This car has 625 pound-feet of torque, and although it doesn't have more power than the new Hellcat Red Eye, the Mustang is a little bit of a smaller car than the Challenger, and that means this is a little quicker. Ford says this does 0 to 60 in 3.3 seconds. But it's not all about straight-line speed, because Ford insists that the new GT500 was designed for the racetrack and not just the drag strip. And that means it's kind of an all-in-one car. Of course, it's also priced like one. This starts at $74,000 with shipping. If you want to add the carbon fiber track package, that'll be another $18,000. If you want painted stripes, add another ten dollars and those aren't the only options. There are many others. They're just some of the more crazily priced ones, meaning that this is a Ford Mustang that can easily cost over $100,000. So is it worth it? Today, I'm going to find out. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the new GT500, and I'm going to show you all of the interesting quirks and features of the newest and most expensive Mustang. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the new GT500, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the GT500 with some first impressions when you walk up to this car. Now, you can instantly tell that it's something special for many reasons, one of which is the fact that there really aren't any Ford logos on the outside of this car. You have little Ford logos in the center caps, and you have one Ford logo at the top of the windshield in this little sunshade area. But that's it. None in the front, none in the back. It doesn't really say Ford anywhere. You have to just kind of know. But instead, replacing the Ford logos, we have some Cobra badges. On the front fender, you can see this large, angry Cobra. In the front grill, instead of a Ford or a Mustang badge, the angry Cobra is back. And same deal on the back. You have this Cobra on the back of the car on the trunklet. And it's also true of the key. No Ford, no Mustang logos here. You just have a Cobra once again, which is a nice, consistent badging theme. Now, I will say on the outside of this car, it does say Shelby GT500, but only in one place, and it's subtle. You have Shelby printed on the front lip spoiler and GT500 printed in the grill, but that's it. Otherwise, you just kind of have to know. And I get the feeling that people who get excited about this car, they will know. And next up, another clear giveaway on the outside of this car that this isn't your regular, ordinary Mustang is the wing. This wing is absolutely massive. Now, this wing comes with the carbon fiber track package that costs $18,000. This car has the carbon track package, so it has the giant wing. If you don't get the package, you still get a wing, but as you can see, it's smaller and more rational and reasonable. But if you get the package, you get this 
massive thing. Of course, the carbon fiber track package gives you more than just a wing. By far the highlight of the $18,000 carbon track package is the wheels. You get carbon fiber wheels. Now, 18 grand seems like a lot for an option package, but it's actually kind of a bargain when you factor in the wheels because buying a set of carbon fiber wheels often costs 15 to $20,000 on its own. Well, here it is in a package with a bunch of other stuff for only 18,000. What's the benefit of a carbon fiber wheel? Well, if you've ever picked one up, it's amazing. It weighs basically nothing. You can lift one right off the ground with basically no effort, and it dramatically saves you weight in a place where it really, really matters. So if you're serious about track use, you're gonna want the track package and those carbon fiber wheels. Now, another difference with the new GT500 compared to a regular Mustang on the outside is the hood. For one thing, it's massive. There is a huge power bulge to kind of tip your hand that you have a little bit more power than you might expect from an ordinary Mustang. But it also has these like hood strikes through it that look like the strikes you would see on the back window of a Z28 Camaro in the 80s. I find these things hilarious, but I also like the kind of subtle and yet kind of not so subtle ways that this car distinguishes itself from the regular Mustang. But by far the most interesting element of the hood is how to open it. You go and pull the latch in the driver's footwell, and you would think that just pops open the hood, but it doesn't. You can see nothing really happened. Instead, you have to pull the latch then come up to the hood and push these little black plastic circles. Those are the hood pins, an old school muscle car characteristic, and only once you've pressed those is the hood released, although it's worth noting that even after you press those, you still have to unlatch the hood in front just like a normal hood. So the hood pin is probably not really necessary, but they add to the cool factor just a little. But once you finally get under the hood, you can see it is pretty special under here. No giant plastic engine cover that covers up everything so you can't see it. Instead, this is a really cool look that is punctuated by a giant Cobra graphic at the very top of the engine. Now, right below that, you can see that it says hand built with pride, GT500. And then the signature of the person who I guess was responsible for final assembly is stamped into that plaque so you can see who to blame if your engine should fail. This is a very, very cool look under here, very much fitting of what this car is all about. Now, at the very front of the engine compartment, you can see that it says carbon fiber composite, once again reminding you that this is no ordinary Mustang or ordinary Mustang engine bay. And next up, a couple of other ways you can tell apart the GT500 from the regular Mustang. One is the brakes. The front brake rotors on this car are 16 and a half inches, which is insane. I have vehicles that have wheels smaller than this car's front brakes. That is truly an unbelievable number. Of course, another way you can tell is the exhaust, which I will cover in a second. But moving on to the back of this car, I want to talk about some other interesting quirks and features, starting with the taillights. Yes, this car still has the famous Ford Mustang sequential turn signals that light up one, then the next, and then the next. Now, in previous videos, I've talked about how other automakers were not allowed to use these turn signals, so why is Ford? The answer is that the regulation governing these turn signals is all about the first turn signal flash. And in this case, the first flash is is large enough to meet the standard, and so Ford is allowed to have these sequential turn signals. For Audis, their first turn signal flash would be too small to meet the government standard, and that's why Audi isn't allowed to have these turn signals. But because the first turn signal flash in the Mustang is large enough each time the turn signals light up, the Mustang gets away with it. Now, next up, I want to talk stripes, and you can see that this car has stripes, but these are the stripes for the cheapskates. These are just vinyl stripes and you could take them right off. If you want painted stripes, like I mentioned before, Ford is charging $10,000 for the privilege, or you could just get these vinyl ones for free or some dramatically lower cost, I'm not sure. Either way, if you are absolutely dead set on having painted stripes, you can, but you'll be paying as much as a good used Mustang for them. 
And since we're talking about paint, might as well mention this color. This color is called Grabber Lime, and it is new for the 2020 model year. One interesting thing about this color is that it's free. It doesn't cost anything to upgrade to Grabber Lime. So if you want your Mustang or your GT500 to resemble Kermit the Frog, this is your chance. And next up, since we're around back, might as well get into the trunk of the GT500. You can pop it open with a little button down here and then lift it up and you can see that there's nothing interesting at all about this trunk. It's just a trunk you would find in a Mustang. And in fact, it looks pretty cheap. This material is clearly the cheapest stuff they could find, but who really cares? When you have 760 horsepower, you're not exactly getting upset about your trunk lining material. With that said, I do have one slightly legitimate complaint about the trunk, and that is that there's no handle or latch on the inside of the trunk that you can use to close it. They don't have anything in here. That means you have to stick your hand on the outside of the trunk to close it. But the problem is that they have this piano black trim on the outside of the trunk. And so every single time you close your trunk, you will see that there is residue from grease from your fingers on the trunk lid. Now, the kind of people who own these cars usually polish them and make sure they're beautifully clean. Then you go to close your trunk and suddenly you've kind of messed it up. I wish they would just put a little handle on the inside of the trunk lid to solve that problem. And next up, we climb inside the GT500 where the very first thing you'll notice is the seats. And I'm not talking about the front seats. Although the front seats are grippy Recaros that really hold you in place on the track. They're very narrow. They have the Cobra on their backs and they look really cool. They're also manually adjustable, which is getting to be a problem when you're going over the $100,000 mark, but that's what they are. But anyway, the front seats are not the seat related item that you notice. What you notice is the back seats, or rather, the lack of back seats. This car doesn't have any. That might surprise you because you're probably used to the Ford Mustang being a car with front seats and back seats, but not this time. Now, that's not true of every GT500. This car comes standard with rear seats, but you delete them if you get the carbon fiber track package in order to save a little bit more weight. So there are no back seats back there, just carpeted holes where the back seats would have been. There's even a little decal in the very center reminding you, don't sit back here because you don't have back seats. And speaking of that carbon fiber track package, I already mentioned that it got you the big wing, the carbon wheels, and now you know about the deleted rear seats, but there's one other big interior item you get with that carbon fiber track package, and that would be a carbon fiber dashboard. It's not the entire dashboard, but most of what's visible is finished in carbon fiber. It's a cooler look, and it probably saves a couple of pounds in the process too. It's one more item that goes along with that package. Now, next up, I wanna move on to some other interesting quirks and features in here. And I'm going to start with some buttons that you do not have in your car. I'm going to start in the center control stack where there is an exhaust button. You probably don't have one of those, but if you do, you don't have it like this. This car has four different modes of exhaust. Okay, you have normal, which sounds like this. <laughs> Then you have sport, which sounds like this. Then you have track, which sounds really amazing. Take a listen. So now you're thinking, what could the fourth mode possibly be if we've already gone up to track? What's above track? The answer is the fourth mode is quiet which sounds like this. As you can tell, that is far, far quieter than all of the other exhaust modes. So if you're leaving to go to Cars and Coffee early on a Sunday morning, you don't wanna wake up your family or your neighbors, put it in quiet mode so you can drive down the street without disturbing anybody. It's actually a pretty good idea. Now, next we move on to the button to the right of the exhaust button, and that would be the mode button, which changes the drive modes. You may have a mode button in your car, but it's pretty noteworthy in here. For one thing, there are five modes. You have normal, sport, track, drag strip, and slippery. 
there's some interesting modes in there. And when you cycle through them, some major changes happen to the gauge cluster. In normal, it looks like a pretty normal gauge cluster, nothing particularly interesting here. When you switch it to sport, you can see the tachometer kind of unrolls itself and becomes a little bit larger for sporty driving. But when you switch into track, that's when things really change. You can now see the tachometer has this large horizontal display on the top of the screen, so you can really focus on your engine speed this is the same display for drag strip, which is really important when you're on a track. You want to see exactly where you want to shift at your shift point. And so that is what you want to have emphasized on your gauge cluster. This is a major benefit of having the gauge cluster be screens. You can have it be configurable based on what setting you're currently in, which can really help you out on the racetrack. And next up, moving on with our tour of unusual buttons in this car. On the steering wheel, you have a button with a Cobra on it. Not often you get to press a button with a snake on it, but when you do, various performance items come up in the gauge cluster. For example, you can set the performance shift indicator, which will light up or beep to let you know that it's time to shift, which can be useful on a racetrack. You can also use this button to access your lap timer if you want, and various other different performance metrics. And you can use it to configure the color you want your interior lighting to be. So if you want to change your ambient lighting color, you can do that by going into your Cobra button if you want to make things racier in here. And next up, two other buttons you probably don't have in your car. Over on the left on the steering wheel, there's a button with a steering wheel on it. So the steering wheel has a steering wheel button. If you press that button, it allows you to change the feel of the steering. And you can choose between normal, sport, and comfort in case you want the steering to be more comfortable. Above the steering wheel button on the steering wheel, you have a suspension button. If you push that, it allows you to dial in which suspension setting you want. Here, you only have a choice between normal and sport. And next up, some other interesting quirks and features in this interior. One is that there aren't really any reminders in here that you're driving a Ford either. You can see on the steering wheel pad, you again have the Cobra logo. And same deal on the seats. Like I mentioned, you have the Cobra stitched into the seats. Doesn't say Ford, doesn't say Mustang. The only place it says Ford in this interior is on the door sill. It says Ford Performance, but of course, that's covered up when you're driving, when you close the door. There are very few reminders in this car that you're driving a Ford. Instead, you're driving a Cobra. Now, on the subject of interior badging, one other item worth noting, over on the passenger side of the dashboard, you have a little plaque that says GT500. It has the snake picture again, and it tells you which chassis number car you have. You can see this one is called PP0012. I imagine PP stands for pre-production, so this isn't in the actual production sequence, but that's where your production number will be if you get one of these. And next up, another interesting interior quirk is the gear shifter. Now, even though all these Shelby GT GT350s were manual transmission only. All of the GT500s are automatic transmission only, and it's a dual clutch automatic. And you can see the shift lever is in the center, and it is a dial. This is the same shift dial that Ford is going to with various other vehicles from the Explorer to the GT Supercar, and you just kind of twist it to put it in gear. If you want to go into manual mode, you just press that big M in the middle, and then you're shifting gears yourself. But without a clutch pedal. Next up, another item I like in this interior is the steering wheel because it's almost completely finished in Alcantara, which is a good substance if you want to go on the racetrack. Leather is more durable than Alcantara, but it can get slippery if your hands get sweaty like they do on hot racetrack days. Alcantara really is the substance you want for a steering wheel for a track-oriented car. And speaking of the Alcantara steering wheel, you also have Alcantara on the seats, which again is the substance you want there for about the same reason. It kind of prevents you from sliding around, which is a problem you could have if you're just sitting on leather seats. And next up, another interesting item in this interior, you have the climate vents, which are noteworthy because in the middle, Ford could have fit three climate vents for more climate blowing power. But instead, they ditched a potential center climate vent and they put in an oil pressure and an oil temperature gauge, which is probably more important for a track oriented car like this. So in the center, you have four circles, but only two of those circles are actual climate vents. Now, next up, another interior talking point is below those center circles, and that would be the infotainment system, which is Ford's latest sync system. Now, this is not going to be a make or break for basically 
literally anybody. No one will buy or not buy the GT500 because of sync. But it's important to mention that sync has dramatically improved from earlier versions. Some of the earliest versions got terrible reviews because they were slow, they would crash, but the latest system, far more responsive to my touch, as you can see, it works pretty well. I move my finger around the map, very responsive to every touch and input that I make. This is a far, far improved infotainment system compared to older sync systems, if that's all you're familiar with. One other thing I like about this system is the fact that Ford has kept all the climate controls as physical buttons, so you don't have to go into the screen to make simple adjustments to the climate controls. I especially like these rocker switches for the climate temperature. They feel good, they look good, and I like that little detail in the middle of this car. And next up, I want to move on to the gauge cluster screen for a second, specifically how much I love the reset button. In your car, if you want to reset your trip odometer, you have to hold down a little button and it will reset. In this, it gives you a timer for how close it is to resetting, and when it hits the end of that line, then it will reset. It's like, wait, 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 okay, it's reset. And I just think that's kind of a cool way to do it. Now, I covered this gauge cluster screen and the infotainment system in much greater detail in my review of the regular new Mustang, which I will link in the description below instead of going back over basically everything. One other interesting item worth noting in this interior, though, is the dimmer switch for the interior lights. It's over by the headlight control, and it's separated into two different buttons. On the left, you have the button that will dim the lights, and on the right, you have the button that will brighten the lights. These buttons are very large, larger than the volume control buttons on the steering wheel. This has to be the most real estate ever given to interior light dimming buttons in the entire history of the car industry. And so those are the quirks and features of the 2020 Shelby GT500. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the GT500. Uh, I've been excited to drive this car pretty much ever since they announced it because I love the GT350 so much. Um, that's been one of my favorite cars that I've driven in the last few years. A huge, huge surprise. Went in thinking it would be a Mustang. Came out absolutely blown away by its all-around package, including the steering and handling. But you look at a car like this on paper, and of course you get a little nervous. 760 horsepower, have they just created a car purely for straight line speed? All right, well first thing, unless you have the exhaust in quiet mode, the exhaust sounds just wonderful. Really, really loud, throaty, grumbly. Uh, the GT350R had a similar sound to it. It also sounded just fantastic. Uh, they haven't lost that, and this sounds great. Now, when you're sitting in here, you do see some remnants of the fact that this is a Ford Mustang. Um, some stuff just isn't really all that nice. You have a lot of plastic, the climate vents, the steering wheel, all the buttons. Uh, and when you're spending, that's fine when you're spending 40 or 50 for a Mustang, and you're getting all this performance. But when you're spending over 100, it gets a little less fine. Even though you get a car that does 0 to 60 and 3.3 for over 100, it's still $100,000. And when you spend that money at BMW, you get an M4 with a very nice interior. It might be slower, but it's more upscale. The people who buy this car will have to be comfortable with the fact that it is not the nicest on the inside or even really anywhere near the nicest. All right, jumping on the highway, let's see what we can do. this fantastic engine note and I also love the fact this was true of the GT350 as well but the moment you put even a little bit of your foot into it that's like a quarter throttle and you hear it and it does the downshift which in this car is very quick because of the dual clutch and suddenly you're off to the races literally the ride quality is better than I was expecting it to be given the state of this car it is rough this is not a luxury car that's not the intent um, but it's definitely less rough than you might think given that this is you know one of the craziest performance cars that's going to be coming out this year and then you can just drop the 
hammer. Just like the GT350R, it feels quick to throw around. Uh, you change direction with the steering wheel, the car changes direction instantly. Very, very precise steering. And adding all this power doesn't screw it up that much. You put 760 horsepower in a car and you are changing the character of it to an extent. This is certainly more of a straight line car than the GT350 and especially the GT350R were. But that doesn't mean that it's only a straight line car and I'm impressed with the handle. Now as for whether I would rather get this or a Hellcat or a ZL1, uh, I've driven them all and uh, Demon, my take is I love the Hellcat and I think it's the most insane of all these cars, but uh, it's just big. It's a big, bulky vehicle and it does not drive like this. Neither does the Demon. They're not this precise. They're not this tight. Great cars, great for straight line, great for bragging rights, and they're just insane. And they named the car. It has, it has a cursor in its name. I love it. I also love the ZL1. I think it's a great car, but it does not compare to this in terms of sound, technology, or steering precision. This is the one. I think this is probably the best all-rounder. I could totally see why someone would get the Hellcat because it's just so ridiculous. Uh, and it's at this point so well known. It's like buying a 911. Um, but to me, this is the one if you really want to go on a track and if you want to go fast in a straight line, uh, this is the coolest car. And so that's the 2020 Shelby GT500. Too much power? Probably. Too much money? Probably, but it is the ultimate Ford Mustang. And while I think I could make a case that the GT350 was a little better, a little more finesse, a little more precision, this is certainly more insane. And more insanity is just what we needed from Ford Mustang drivers. Anyway, now it's time to give the new GT500 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the GT500 looks cool and thrilling and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration 0 to 60 is 3.3 seconds, which gives it a 9 out of 10. Handling is very sharp, but not quite as precise as the GT350R, which was truly amazing, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Fun factor is huge, largely because it really combines excellent handling and amazing acceleration. I just wish it had a manual, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Cool factor is pretty good. This is the coolest Mustang, but it's still a Mustang, and it gets a 6 out of 10 for a total a weekend score of 38 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It has a lot of nice stuff, but it's still lacking some of the top luxuries, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort, the seats are tight and the ride is a bit rough, but it's not so bad, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Quality is only average, with an acceptable interior, but not a great one, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Practicality is low on account of no back seats. Still, it has a roomy front seat and a big trunk, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Value is high. These are very expensive, and they're not that nice inside, but they truly deliver where it matters, speed, handling, performance. The GT500 offers amazing performance for the money and it gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 26 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 64 out of 100, which places it here against other modern muscle cars. The GT500 actually loses slightly to the GT350R, which has a slightly higher weekend score because the handling is a bit more precise and the manual transmission just ups the fun factor a little. But the GT500 still fits in well, beating out the ZL1 and the Z06, and it's an amazing performance car.